Well, good morning, Heartland Church. You guys look awesome today. I, uh, if I've not met you before, my name is Kendra. My husband, Dusty, and I are the lead pastors here at the church, and we're just so glad that you decided to be in service with us today. If you're watching online, I love you. Look, you guys, when I speak, we're doing this together, so I need your feedback. I need you to know that you understand what I'm saying and that you even think my jokes are funny, okay? <laughs> All right, so just being real with you. So, how many of you noticed that it got really hot this week? Straight up, that came out of nowhere to me, you know? Summertime is officially here. It has arrived. And you know, I hope that y'all take it seriously whenever Dusty and I say to you, we really want you to get away with your family. We want you to take a trip, just get a few days of rest and refreshing because vacations are important to you and to your family. And because it is summertime, I thought this might be a good opportunity to share one of mine and Dusty's vacation stories with you. <clears throat> So, we like to go to Mexico. It's kind of our thing. Really, we just like to be anywhere where there's a beach, or I like to be anywhere that there's a beach. And Dusty just loves me, and he endures. But when I think about vacation, I think about the sun, tanning, good food, someone else to make my bed for me, right? I think about the beach, and I also think about sharks. Sharks. How many of you know that Shark Week is just around the corner? Oh, where are my Shark Week viewers? Who watches? Oh, you are my people. You are my people. If you don't know what Shark Week is, it's a one week that the Discovery Channel takes to give like stories and documentaries and experiments all about sharks. And I love Shark Week. In fact, I really enjoy, it's a little morbid, I know, but I really enjoy listening to the testimonies of people who have survived a shark attack because who knows, I might need to know that one day, you know? And so the cool thing about Shark Week is you learn all kinds of fun facts. Like, did you know a crocodile can actually take out a bull shark? I did, I watched the documentary. <laughs> Did you know that a great white has the power bite capacity of 4,000 PCI? I know, I watched the experiment. <laughs> Did you know that right now they are testing and experimenting on a gas? This is so cool that you can take a can with you into the ocean and if there's a shark nearby, you open that up and it works as a potent shark repellent. I know this, Shark Week, baby, all the way. So here's the thing about the sharks. All my life, since I was a little girl, I've been intrigued. They're magnificent creatures, I think. Now, the problem that I have with this is this. Even though I love to study them and know everything about them, I know that when I go on vacation and I get in the ocean, it's gonna mess with me mentally. It always does. I am that person where wherever we go, I am always looking up statistics on shark sightings and shark attacks for the particular beak that we are traveling to. That's me. It's like, I need information. I'm not gonna go to beach if I don't know my environment, okay? I need to know. I need to know what's happening. And here's the thing. If you've ever watched enough Shark Week, you'll know that Mexico is home to some of the largest sharks where we love to go. So back to my trip with Dusty. We did this about 10 years ago. We decided that we were gonna get adventurous and take a snorkeling excursion. Now, let me just say, this is not your regular snorkeling excursion, okay? We didn't realize what we were in for until we were in it. They took us on a boat to what felt like the middle of the ocean. No land in sight just pure open water. And the captain says, jump out, swim. So like dummies, we jump out into the water and we start swimming. And then it occurs to me, man, like I really don't see land. <laughs> These waves, they're really rough out here. And I look up at the boat and the captain and the crew are shouting down to us, make sure you stick in groups. That's odd, and if you're a Shark Week viewer, you start thinking, what, what is happening here? 
And then all of a sudden, so Dusty goes and he gets on his paddle board. I grab my snorkel gear and then it hits me. They didn't give us a guide. There's no snorkel guide in the water with me. And I'm looking around at everything and then it's like all that information, shark week, right? I start seeing all the warning signs. It's happening. And I start to think red flags. Red flag number one, the crew doesn't even wanna get in the water. <laughs> red flag number two, the waves are choppy. I can see in a distance, a storm is on its way in. Red flag number three, the water is so dark, I can't see what's underneath my feet. And let me tell you, that's why I don't do lakes very well. I gotta know what's underneath my feet. That's not okay to me. Red flag number four, the waves are so big that it's popping salt water into my snorkel tube and I'm inhaling and swallowing salt water. I literally have no control over this environment, none. Then there is another red flag. All these people, probably about 20 of us, are just in the water, splashing around, having a great time. Can I just tell you that's nothing but a dinner bell for every living creature nearby? <laughs> that's all that is. And then red flag number six, and I gotta tell you, this is the one that sealed it for me. As I'm in the water, a darker toned lady starts swimming right next beside me. And I notice she's wearing a brown body colored long sleeved swimsuit. Now, everyone knows, guys, this is like one plus one is two. If I'm a predator at the bottom of the ocean looking up, that lady looks like a seal. I am not going to be attacked because of mistaken identity next to seal lady, okay? And this is when things start snapping in my brain, okay? I begin to panic. I am trying to outswim this lady. She wants me to be her buddy. She will not leave me alone. And then I go from every constant like documentary, facts, information that I know that could be a great survival to, to 100%. I am now in a full on horror scene of the movie Jaws. I am panicking, I can't breathe, my heart is pounding, I am swallowing salt water, I'm getting nauseated, I cannot find Dusty, I don't see him anywhere, was he the first victim? I don't know, I'm freaking out, I'm not having fun, I want out of the water, get me out now, I hate this excursion so much, and so I do what every shark viewer knows not to do. I begin to scream bloody murder and thrash my body in the water. The captain throws over a lifesaver, you guys, to pull me into the boat. And I get inside, I'm like, oh God, I'm safe. And I watch, and I wait, and nothing happened. <laughs> when Dusty finally came on board, he just looked at me, like, you big wimp. <laughs> and I felt so dumb in that moment. But, you know, I think it's just so funny how in an instant, fear took over my body. I mean, fear, I, I ruined what could have been a wonderful experience, ruined it. And that's a funny story. It's silly and honestly, it's quite embarrassing, but you're my family, so I can share it, you know? But I tell you this story to give you an example of how quickly fear can escalate in our minds. So today, the title of my message is, What's in the Water? Now, your fear might not be about snorkeling in the middle of the ocean. Your fear might be something that's closer to home, right? You might have a fear of the manifestation of something that's already happened, and you don't want it to repeat itself. You might have fear that you don't have control in certain situations, so you actually sabotage yourself in order to have control over a situation. We all have fears, especially when it comes to relationships, our health, um, when it comes to uh, finances, and now apparently even politics. We all carry fears, and before we know it, the fear is weighing us down, and the fear is controlling our joy. I think it's even taking away our joy. I think that one of the devil's biggest tools to steal our joy is fear. In fact, Jesus says in John 10:10, 10, 10, he said the thief's purpose is to kill, steal and destroy. 
But he, Jesus said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Fear will steal your joy. Fear will steal opportunities away from you. And fear has a way of taking over any possible rational thought that we might have. And if we allow it, fear, it can build up things in our head that's not even true. Sometimes we create fear. Sometimes we're the ones that create the anxiety. So I want you to hear this, that if you're not careful, your fear can overwhelm you so much that you can't see your purpose clearly. You can't see the joys. You can't celebrate the beauty around you or the wins that you've had. Instead, you can become stagnant and you can become miserable. And the last thing that we ever feel with fear is Jesus' promise of a rich and abundant life. So however justified that your fear might be, I want you to know if we're not careful, it will paralyze us. It will hold us down and it will keep us from the life that God intended us to have. I wanna give you an illustration of what that looks like because you know me, I love illustrations. Can I have my volunteers come up here please? Looking good, guys. Now, oh, from both sides, hi. Did you know that everyone in this room has a filter? You have a filter on how you receive and send out communication, all right? You have a filter, and sometimes experiences can impact your filter, I'm preaching here to you today and you're trying, you're filtering now. Do I like her? Do I understand what she's saying? Sometimes our joys can impact our filter. Your filter is basically whatever you believe to be your truths. And that is what leads you into making the next decision that you have to make. If we're not careful, fears can latch on to our filter. I just want you guys to hold on. So I want you to think of this rope as your filter line, okay? Each one of these people, they represent a fear. They represent fear of rejection, fear of being misunderstood, fear of politics, fear of harm, fear of getting sick, fear of losing their job. They all represent something. And here's the deal. However we filter through these fears, it impacts the decisions that we make and let me tell you, we have important decisions that we have to make every day. We make decisions that will prosper us or decisions that are gonna burden us. And so my question to you is, if you have these fears behind you, just a little slack, guys, just a little. <laughs> How can you possibly put one foot in front of the other and make the decisions that you need to make for the God-given purpose that he has given you if everything that you decide is filtered through every one of these fears that's holding you back? These fears, they can cause you, that's, yeah. you're doing great, guys. This fear, it can cause you to hesitate, right? These fears, they can actually cause you to stand still. These fears can cause you to take a step back. We cannot filter our life and live the life that God has destined for us to have if we are dragging around all of this garbage weighing behind us. And here's the thing. This is what's so crazy to me. Sometimes when we've decided that we're exhausted and I've had enough, I can't take these fears anymore, God, I surrender. I surrender. Just take it away from me and we let the filter go. And then we trust in the Lord and we say, God, I need you to be my filter. I need every decision that I make to go through you. And we start reading his word. We start spending time with him every day. He gets bigger in our eyes, right? Things are going good. But catch this. All it takes is one little thing. It might be a memory. It might be something new that you've never faced before. Whatever it is, it takes one little thing and we choose to pick up those fears right back up again. It is a cycle that we continue to have and it's a cycle that keeps us from living in the richness and the fullness that God has planned for you. Thanks guys, you're awesome.
I like to call these fears what ifs. They're the what ifs in your life. They're the what ifs like, what if I get divorced? What if this marriage doesn't work? What if I can't beat this addiction or I have another relapse? What if we can't get pregnant? What if we have another miscarriage? What if I die of cancer? What if the cancer comes back? What if I can't sell the house? What if I can't retire? What if I do retire and then I feel like I have no purpose? What if my business fails? What if I get fired? What if my kids make unhealthy choices and have toxic relationships? These what ifs impact our decisions, and it is good just to let them go and let God take over. This is a tension that we feel every day of our lives. We're supposed to be searching for that rich life that Jesus came for us to have, but we can't do it if we're carrying around what ifs. The more that Dusty and I and our team live and we try to pastor you and we try to love you well, the more I've learned something. I've learned that everyone wants a savior in their life. But not everyone necessarily wants a Lord in their life. We all want to be rescued. That's the fun part. But not everyone wants to be told how to live your life. People, people can be so quick to ask Jesus for help, and he comes, he does what he's great at, he's always there. But when you ask him to make him the Lord of your life, that's a little different. Mm, I don't know if I'm ready to make that commitment. I'm not ready to give you full control, God. Because when you ask the Lord to be in full control, that means that it requires daily submissions of your thoughts, it requires daily surrender of your will, and it requires a daily trust and a relationship with him. Obedience and trust are totally different than being rescued. You need more faith and less fear in order to live a life with Jesus at the center of it. So today I just wanna give you a few quick steps of how you can avoid being a slave to fear and how you can feel empowered as you lean towards faith. Faith in a God who knows it all and sees it all and just wants to give you peace in the middle of everything that you're going through. So today you'll see in your notes, I'm gonna give you three steps. The three steps are how to go from fear to faith. Did you know that we're not the only people that ever experience this tension. The tension of letting go of our what ifs and fully trusting in the Lord. Did you know that the disciples actually experienced this tension? They had a moment where they chose fear over, faith, uh, over trusting the Lord. And I want you to think about this. Put yourself in their shoes. Here they are with Jesus. They're traveling with him. They're doing life with him. They're telling jokes around the campfire, strapping on each other's sandals. They're doing all kinds of stuff with Jesus. They have dinners with him. They tell the jokes. And here's the thing. They even claimed to love him. They also claimed that they would die for him. And after all the quality time that they had with Jesus in the flesh, they had a moment of doubt. I'm gonna share with you today a story in Matthew. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 32. We're gonna pop in and out of this story as we go along and I give you the steps. So to set the story up, Jesus had just performed one of his biggest miracles, all right? And the disciples were witnesses of this. He fed over 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. That's a big miracle. I mean, everybody's faith is big at this point in time. So we're gonna pick it up here at verse 22. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples go back to the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills to pray. Night fell and he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away. Far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. I want you to notice what happens next. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. How do you call a man 
that you travel with, have worked with, that you love, someone that you know so well every day, a ghost, a man that chose to take them and pull them out of a mundane life, he chose to give them a life full of purpose and intention, they surrendered everything to him, and yet they saw him in that moment as a ghost. They did that because they allowed their atmosphere to influence them. And we can do the same thing. We can't get on the social media, we can't watch the news, we cannot allow the atmosphere around us to change what we know and shift our faith from the Lord. They allowed the atmosphere to influence them. The fog, the waves, the shaking. It was the creaking of the boat. It was the rain taking over. Everything started blowing up in their minds and their panic began to set in. The fear started taking over. The what ifs started to dominate. And they were so overcome by the storm that they didn't even recognize that Jesus was in the storm with them. And that's the first thing that you have to know today in order to overcome your fear to faith is that one, recognize Jesus is in the storm with you. Look, we're not that much different than the disciples. If we took a moment here and I asked all of you to raise your hands, if you could think of a time that God has been faithful to you, of a time where you thought something was impossible and he came in and shifted it around and he turned it for his good, of his faithfulness, I believe this entire room would have hands raised. We have all experienced his faithfulness and his goodness to us. We know we've been there because we have history with the Lord and yet, and yet, when we see the storm, the unknown in front of us, we struggle, we begin to panic, we get overwhelmed, and we start to think that we have to face this circumstance all alone. We think that we have to do this within our power, but let me tell you something, and this is really serious, God takes offense whenever we try to do things in our own strength instead of giving it over to him. Let me show you what it says in Romans 5. Romans 8, 5, it says, those who think that they can do it in their own end, they end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but they never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's actions in them, they find that God's spirit is free. It's living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open. It's a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in the self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. The person ignores who God is and what he's doing, and listen to this last line, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. This passage convicted me. Sometimes, I don't think that we realize how focusing so much on the what ifs in our lives is actually a form of self-obsession. God doesn't want us replaying the past. He doesn't want us fearing the future. He doesn't want us to obsess over things that we can't even control. All he wants us to do is to take our focus onto him and off of our weakness and off of our humanity. He wants us to surrender all of the what ifs to him. And the Bible will clearly say that we can have faith because we have confidence in a God who will protect us. Look at what it says in Proverbs. You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or destruction that comes upon the wicked. For the Lord is your security and he will keep your foot from getting trapped. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that I serve a God that sees the traps and he sees the storms before I ever even get there and he is always ready to help and rescue. If you believe that this morning, can you just take a moment and say thank you, God? He's so faithful. So going back to the story in Matthew. So they think, oh, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. 
Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yes, come. So Peter goes over the side of the boat and begins to walk on the water towards Jesus. The second step that we have to take from fear to faith is to take courage. Take courage. There's a lot of definitions for courage. We know it's bravery. We know that it's doing something in the face of grief or pain, doing something you don't like but still able to do it. But I want to give you a different definition of courage today. In the Bible, courage is also called good cheer. Good cheer. And in this story, Jesus is commanding Peter to take courage and to be in good cheer. The Greek word translated for courage and Greek cheer, uh, good cheer, it actually means boldness and confidence. So when God commands us to fear not and to be of good cheer and to have courage, he's commanding against fear. But I want you to hear this because this is so important. God doesn't simply command us to have courage with no reason behind it. In nearly every incident in the Bible where God or Jesus says to take courage, it is followed up by the promise that he is with you and that he will sustain you and that he will help you. There's so many scriptures that say this, and I'm just going to read a few to show you that. That God in his nature, he has a perfect plan for you. In Genesis, when God calms Abram, he says, fear not, I am your shield. In Isaiah, God tells the Israelites, fear not. I am the one that helps you. In Deuteronomy, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes before you and he will never leave you or forsake you. There's so many verses like this. I think over 300. But perhaps the one that sticks out the most to me and could be the most impactful is in Matthew 28, 20. When Jesus says, teach these new disciples, that's us. He's referring to us as his new disciples. Teach them all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's his promise to you. In each incident that we see God commanding courage, it's not because it's natural or because it's normal for man to be brave, no. He does it because he knows he's protecting us and he's guiding us and he has a plan for us and he knows what's gonna happen. It's not in our strength, not in our confidence, but 100% in his. And I just wanna say this for a moment. I think now, more than ever, we have to have courage. Living in 2022, Look, it's no accident that you're living this day and this age at this time with everything happening. God trusts you with that. And it is time for us to have courage. We have to have courage. This world needs Christ followers to have courage and to show good cheer. We need examples of what that looks like to show the world. We have to have the courage to endure, to persevere. We have to have the courage to shelter in God and not run away from hard things. We have to have the courage to fight and to stand for the things of God in a world that despises God. We have to stand up and have courage. We need to choose courage. It's always a choice. So you gotta recognize that Jesus is in the storm with you, and then you have to choose courage. We're gonna go back to the story in verse 29. So Jesus says, yeah, come on, Peter. Come in the water. And Peter gets over, and he starts walking on the water towards Jesus. And look what happens in verse 30. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. He shouted, save me, Lord. There we go, needing to be rescued again. But look at this, Jesus immediately reached his hand out and grabbed him, and he said to him, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God they exclaimed. So the third thing that you need from fear to faith is this, 
Just keep your focus on Jesus. Just keep your focus on him. I like to go back to the boat and kind of, when I'm reading stories, I like to put myself in the boat and think what the characters might be thinking. And I gotta tell you, Peter's killing it, right? When he said, come walk on the water with me, I mean, Peter's like, yeah. And he gets out and he starts walking on the water. I mean, his faith was big. It was huge. You gotta think for a moment that the other disciples might have been a little annoyed at this. You know, I mean, here they thought he was a ghost, but now Peter's walking on the water. Matthew's probably talking to look, and he's like, oh, great. Unreal. Peter's never going to let us live this one down. He's such a Messiah moocher. You know, I mean, you can only imagine the conversations that are happening on the boat as this is going on. And meanwhile, Peter, buddy, he's locked in. He is practicing faith. He is staring at Jesus' faith. He is literally seeking the face of his God right in that moment. He's being so obedient to Jesus that he is walking on water and doing the unimaginable in his life. He had total surrender, total trust, but it only took one wave. It only took one splash of water on his face or the wind to take one strand of hair across his eyes and he got terrified. And he started looking at his atmosphere. He started looking at everything around him and took his focus off the Lord. And you know, I can't judge him too harshly for that. There have been times where we've done the same, right? I know that there were times when I felt like, man, Dusty and I are killing it. We're doing it so right. Our faith was big. We're moving strong. We're being bold. Our focus is on the Lord. Everything is going great. And then something unknown comes into our life. When our second daughter was born, Brooklyn, we'd never had any complications with our first. But when Brooklyn was born, she was born with extreme acid reflux. She's four months old, and through this whole time, she can't keep her food down. She'll eat and throw it up. She won't take a two-hour nap. She won't sleep through the night. We've taken her to chiropractors. We've gone to doctors. She's on four different medications. I'm doing everything. I'm nursing her standing up, sideways, laying down. I'm doing everything that I can think of in my power to fix this. And the doctor said, the next step is to have gastrointestinal surgery on her and I panic. That's my baby. She's four months old and we're exhausted. We're just trying to live life with no sleep, right? And so at this time, we're at Daystar in the studio and we were interviewing this guy on set and he stopped talking and he said, you know what? There's some people that are watching today that are sick and God wants to heal you. So wherever you are, I just want you to stand up in front of the TV screen and I'm gonna reach my hand out to you and I'm gonna pray for you. And when I do, God's gonna heal you. I'm gonna tell you what, something rose up in me so fast. I called the babysitter and I said, I know this is crazy, but turn on Daystar and hold Brooklyn up in front of the TV. You know, I was so desperate. I was like, this is the, we'll do anything, do everything. And I want you to know that that man held his hand towards the camera and I could hear Brooklyn in front of the TV, and that day, Brooklyn ate all of her food and didn't throw it up. She took her first two-hour nap, and she slept through the night. We didn't have to go back to any of the medications. We didn't have to have surgery. God did a work in her life, and she was completely and totally healed ever since that moment. Early in that season, I panicked and I looked away. I was scared. I was exhausted. And the whole time, God is saying, I have a plan for this. Why won't you just look back at me? Stop trying to fix it, Kendra. Look at me. I want you to know that He is a good, good God. And He loves you so much. So much. He gives us love that honestly we don't deserve. And yet every day he continues to pour it out on us. 
I think the thing that comforts me the most about this story is that from the very beginning of the passage in Matthew, from the very beginning, Jesus knew they were in trouble. From the very beginning, he shows his care and his concern for us. It said that while they were on the boat, miles away, and a storm wind came, and they were frightened by the heavy waves, it said at three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. Notice how it doesn't say that they cried out for help. Jesus, where are you? No, Jesus already knew they were gonna be in trouble. He already knew what they were about to face. He already knew what was going on. His eyes never left them. Let me tell you, his gaze is constantly on you and he sees everything that you were going through. And he will go as far as to walk on the water to get to you. He is ready to do a miraculous thing in your life. The biggest question is, are you ready to let him? We're gonna pray and I'd like for Dusty to come up here with me. I just want you to get this. If you don't get anything else, he loves you. He's for you. If it's about you, whatever the concern is, doesn't matter if it's big or small, he's all in it. And he wants his best for you. You might be looking at your past, all those fears and saying, how could he possibly use me when I've done this, 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 and this, or I'm struggling with this, this, and this, and what if I fall back into this, this, and this? He doesn't care. He says, let go of your what ifs and trust me. So I would just ask that you would bow your heads right now and we're gonna pray a corporate prayer over you and then Dusty's gonna take over. But Lord, I just wanna first thank you. You're so good and you're so faithful and we don't deserve it, but you are always, always looking out for us. And first Lord, I wanna repent. We wanna repent to you corporately, God for having self-obsession, for looking at things and thinking that we could do this better, for doing things in our strength and for not leaning into you and to trusting you. God, we repent of that. And now we wanna fully surrender all of it to you and just say, take over. Take over and have your way, God. I thank you for your peace, for your joy, for your comfort, for your strength right now on every single person that's here. And I thank you, Lord, that you're gonna wake them up in the middle of the night with sweet, gentle reminders of how you see them. They're your son, they're your daughter, and they love you. And he has so much planned for you. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. With every head bowed right now, I'm just curious to know today, if you're in a season of your life right now where you feel like the waves are high, like Kendra said, and you're just battling fear, there's a fear going on, there's something you're dealing with, in fact, if that's you today, I just want you to be so bold to say, yeah, that's me. Just lift your hand all over this room today. Say, yeah, that's, that's me. I, I'm dealing with a circumstance, and the things in my life seem bigger than the God of my life. Okay, lots of people today. I want you just to put your hands down. Now, I want you to pray with me today. What we're going to ask God is, God, make the image of Jesus be bigger than the waves. Lord, every fear that I have today... I'm lowering it in my own eyes. And we're just going to pray all over the room. Father, right now I pray over every person who feels like they're in a season where they're overwhelmed. We are asking right now by the power of Jesus that you minister to their heart. And today we say and we speak over you right now that God has this. He's got it in his hands. He's got it in control. He's got your world. Listen, if he cares for the sparrow when they fall from the sky, how much more does he care about the circumstances of your life? And so I want you to tell him right now, anytime that you're struggling with fear like this, it's because it's a circumstance that you haven't completely surrendered over to Jesus. So I want you to t take it in your hand right now, like grab it, like hold it. And I want you to say, I want you to physically with your hand now release that and say, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. I trust you with this. You're bigger than this. You've got this in your hands. And I thank you for it right now for touching. I feel the Holy Spirit's presence and power ministering to people right now. We thank you for this word today, God. Seal it in our hearts. 
We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody, say amen with me today and clap your hands all over the room. I want you to do this with me. Just stand on your feet all over the room, and I want our prayer team to come today. And maybe there's a moment here where you need to seal what Kendra has talked about. And by the way, what an incredible word. Did you, did you glean anything from that today? I want you to know that sometimes in my life, I've needed the prayer of someone else about the things that I was facing. I needed to hear somebody else say it and speak it over my life. Sometimes I don't always believe it. Can I just be honest? And I need somebody else to stand in agreement with me. And so our prayer team is going to be here today to uh, agree with each and every one of you that need prayer when the team comes here in just a second. And uh, I want to say this to you. I'm so excited about tomorrow. I'm going to be up here hanging out with all these kiddos and watching them all around. And uh, it's going to be great. And here in just a moment, as I close you out, like I often do, uh, can we just do something? Can we pray over them uh, this morning? Can we just pray that God's spirit would be in them and that, that they would take a hold of a truth? You know what I mean? Sometimes it's just one truth. If a young kid can get it in its heart, uh, I've got two girls that are going to be there. One, it's her very last time to go to Summer Blast. I can't believe it. Next year, she's a teenager, and then I really need your prayer. Uh, but man, we're just believing that this is going to be an incredible time for your kids. And I want to thank, like Mikey did, every volunteer ahead of time, every dream teamer. I so love that you love the next gen. And I'm so thankful for you. It's going to be a great. Hey, listen, if you're a guest with us today after this service, go out into our lobby. We'd love to see you out there. Kendra and I will be out uh, after the service today. We'd love to say hi to you and, and greet you and hang out. Let me tell you about a couple of quick things. Uh, next Sunday is Father's Day, everybody. Are you excited uh, for Father's Day? We've got a special guest with us that day that's going to minister to you. The former chaplain of the New York Yankees is going to be here with us all the way from the Bronx. You're going to love Willie Alfonso as he comes and speaks. It's going to be amazing. Then uh, July 3rd is Honor Weekend where we're honoring all our first responders and teachers and military. You won't want to miss that Sunday uh, on 4th of July weekend. It's going to be great. And we can't wait. Uh, hope to see you there. Uh, if you want to give, there are boxes that are located in the hallways today. You can give in those. You can always give online. Thank you so much. And if you saw the first Saturday video today, uh, I want to say thanks because you help us feed people and love people to life. That was just one of the examples of one of the communities uh, that we go into and so into every month. Uh, so we love you guys. Thank you so much. Let me pray for you today, and we're going to bless you and let you go today. But Father, we pray for every kid. Come on, I want you to pray with me today. We pray for their hearts. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you disciple them. We pray for life change. Lord, we pray that the truth of God's word would get in their heart. And as it gets in their heart, it will not return void. Lord, we love our kids. And so we put a hedge of protection around their hearts and over their minds today. Lord, we ask that you raise up future leaders in the body of Christ through this experience. We pray for every uh, worker, every dream teamer that's going to be with them, Lord God. Help them to be disciple makers as they build the next generation. And Lord, we pray for this message today. Let it get in somebody's heart and let it uh, produce fruit in the name of Jesus. And we pray for the week ahead, Lord God. Be with every family. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. I love you, church. We will see you next Sunday. Have a great weekend. You're officially dismissed. If you want prayer, we're down here to pray with you today. Come on, team. Let's sing them out today.